hi everyone hopefully you can hear me and see me clearly um, to the extent you can't please do shout in the the q a thank you for your interest in gcp infrastructure thank you to sharesoc for the opportunity to present today um, by way of briefest introduction to myself, my name is Philip Kent. I am a director at Gravis. I have been at Gravis for about five years, um, during which time I've led the origination and, and deal structuring uh, activities for, for this fund. And for the last three years or so, um, I have had the role of lead fund manager for GCP infrastructure investments. Prior to Gravis, um, I have a background uh, in the energy sector more widely. Um, in terms of the plan for today, um, and uh, I think Amanda's controlling the slides, so perhaps we can move to the, the agenda. Um, my plan is to, to try and limit the presentation to 30 or 35 minutes or so, um, during which time I propose to talk through a general strategic update in context of the company um, before moving on to the portfolio. I've also included as part of the slides uh, a more detailed finance update, which present the uh, financial results for the company for the year ending 30th September 2020. I don't propose to go through those in a significant amount of detail, but I'm very happy to answer any questions and, and the slides are available for those who would like to, to see that as we present them. Um, so perhaps moving straight to uh, the three core objectives of the fund. Um, GCP Infrastructure Investments has the headline objective of investing in UK-based infrastructure that benefits from some form of public sector-backed revenue stream um, and has a focus on debt. So essentially, in a nutshell, the fund is looking to invest in infrastructure that is currently being supported by government revenue support schemes. And we think that dynamic of long-term capital-heavy assets in, in, in infrastructure, which characterise infrastructure, where it's combined with income that is underpinned by a public sector backed support mechanism is overall an attractive investment opportunity. And within that, um, we focus on the debt part of the capital structure. And I'll, I'll come on to talk more about what that means during the course of these slides. So in doing that, we're trying to achieve three different things for our investors. The first of which um, shown on this slide is dividend income. Income, um, like many of our infrastructure and renewable energy peers, has been absolutely core to, I think, interest in infrastructure as an alternative asset class and the growth in that interest over the last 10 years or so. The company is 10 years old. Um, for seven of those 10 years, we've been paying a dividend of 7.6 pence per share per year. That dividend was reset for a at a target of seven pence for the financial year commencing on the 1st of October. And I can talk to some of the reasons why we made that shift and that announcement during the course of, of my um, presentation. Where the company sits today against share price, that represents around a 7% uh, dividend yield on share price. Diversification is the second objective, and I, for me, this is really key. We're not a single asset fund, um, so we're not a solar fund or a wind fund or a PFI fund or a social housing fund. Indeed, we have the explicit objective of diversifying across multiple asset classes. And what that's meant historically is that once um, asset, we've invested in asset classes early, and, and I think the key for us has always been trying to identify those new, interesting, exciting areas of government support that benefit from an attractive risk-adjusted return, get into them early, and those sectors will mature and, and risks will evolve um, and the required return in those sectors will, will reduce. Um, more investors will become interested in those sectors and yields traditionally have come down. So having the explicit objective of diversifying has allowed us to not live or die by that evolution in an asset class, but rather to move away from asset classes when they become um, too competitively priced for, for the fund or, or rather the risk adjusted return becomes less attractive and to continue to look into new sectors. Finally, capital preservation. So I guess the focus on debt has meant that we are more concerned with the protection of downside risks rather than perhaps investing to create exposure to significant upside opportunities should certain market events or, or underlying assumptions occur. And I think capital preservation, as I'll come on to describe, is absolutely core cool when we disclose and, and think about 
dividend coverage um, and and I think that's a, again a distinguishing factor between us and a number of our peer group which which I think is absolutely fundamental and um, just in terms of some of those numbers from a diversification perspective we have 50 separate investments where we sit today as you'll see on a fo the following slide I think that re represents a significantly higher number of um, underlying assets where we sit um, today in terms of NAV versus share price, they're roughly equivalent. Um, historically, the, the trust has traded at a premium to uh, NAV. Perhaps, Amanda, if we could flick to the next slide. Um, this shows historically what that premium has been with the, the dotted line there being the stated NAV and, and the share price in green. Um, I guess in, in our view, there is nothing that has fundamentally changed that justifies the derating that's happened in the share price over the last number of months. I think we're, we firmly believe the fundamentals of the company remain absolutely strong. There's nothing investors are missing in terms of something fundamental that's changed to justify the derating. Um, and I, again, I can come, come back to some of the points that I think remain, uh, remain a key strength of this company. And, um, and I think ultimately mean that the current share price re represents a, an a, attractive entry point relative to, to history of this fund. I think the 10 year point, so the company celebrated its 10th year anniversary from IPO last year. Um, and looking back, I think uh, we've been very pleased with what we've delivered for investors. Um, I think over that 10 years, as I mentioned, the 7.6 pence dividend has been paid for, I think, eight years by the time it, it ceased. Um, total shareholder return of just under 109%. Market capitalization uh, of just shy of a billion, um, which has grown relatively steadily over the course of the 10 years and the 50 investments which uh, make up a diversified underlying pool of investments. Um, moving to the next uh, slide, if we may, and I wanted to focus for a moment on in terms of the strategic positioning of the company um, and perhaps looking forward to what inf the infrastructure market in the UK currently is. And being a fund that targets public sector backed revenue streams, the key question for us is always what areas of infrastructure development are the government supporting at any point in time? This slide is, is constructed based on the National Infrastructure Strategy, and this is the first time the UK has published an infrastructure strategy. It's been a long delayed document. It's in response to the National Infrastructure Commission, which is the government's independent advisor on infrastructure, their recommendations, which were published back in 2018. And that strategy pointed to three areas, economic recovery, the levelling up agenda and net zero transition. And I think perhaps if I could, without going into the detail here, perhaps summarise where I think we currently are. I think the world of public private sector procurement that characterise PFI or other forms of PPP has largely gone away. I think in the National Infrastructure Strategy and various consultations leading up to that, the government were pretty clear that they didn't want to see PPP or PFI models being used moving forward. And it feels to me that the type of assets that historically have been supported by those mechanisms, so leisure, judiciary services, community infrastructure, healthcare, education, is being funded directly by central government where we sit today, rather than through a public private procurement model. So the scope for those sorts of assets being invested in the future, I think, is increasingly limited. I think the establishment of the National Infrastructure Bank, um, which there was more detail given in the recent budget, is particularly interesting. Um, we saw a number of opportunities through the Green Investment Bank, which was, I guess, the, the predecessor to, to this, perhaps, where the fund could invest alongside the Green Investment Bank in, um, in financing new interesting areas of infrastructure, particularly in the biomass, anaerobic digestion, offshore wind sectors. Um, so what the National Infrastructure Bank focuses on and the extent to which it crowds in private sector investment opportunities, which is absolutely its stated intent, is something we'll be looking very closely at over the coming months. So I think what that leaves in terms of where we currently sit in, in investment opportunities is this transition to net zero. The UK has a legally binding obligation to embark on this journey prior to 2050 of, of achieving net zero emissions. And I can't overstate the extent of that change um, that 
in, in, in our energy system that, that is going to be associated with that. Perhaps if we could move on to the next slide. This slide is, is um, I guess, trying to illustrate the scale of that transition. And the chart on the left there is taken from the recent energy white paper, which came out at the end of last year, and shows on one side the, the current energy system and how that's made up. And on the right there shows the Committee on Climate Change scenario for a net zero energy system. And the headlines there are there's a 30% overall reduction in energy, in energy use, so energy efficiency mechanisms, an absolute reduction in how much energy we use is a part of it. But within that, there's some interesting trends. So electricity demand is doubling as we electrify our heating system to decarbonize, as we electrify our transport system to decarbonize. Hydrogen has a role in our energy system where it doesn't today, and that has a corresponding knock-on to electricity demand. Interestingly, gas and oil are still a, a feature, and um, so therefore there are still emissions. So we need to establish a new asset class in terms of carbon sequestration, whether that's natural sequestration through forestry uh, or more industrial applications of carbon capture and storage. I think of particular relevance to this fund, the role of bioenergy is, is notable. 10% um, of our portfolio is exposed to, to biomass projects, 7% or so is exposed to anaerobic digestion. And I think we've always assumed that those assets won't have a life beyond the current subsidy period, but increasingly, we're seeing models being developed where those assets will have a fundamental role in the transition to net zero, whether that's through the production of hydrogen, um, the decarbonisation of heat, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage is a net negative source of emissions. So there is a, a direction of travel here and, and the Committee on Climate Change themselves estimate a cost or a peak annual cost of £50 billion per year associated with this, this transition to net zero. And perhaps taking a step back for a moment, I think the two ways, in my view, that policy will support this transition is either um, top-down regulation that says there aren't going to be any petrol or diesel cars sold in the UK from 2035. There's every new home has to have an energy efficiency rating of X. So top-down regulation is one way of achieving it. The other way is a carbon market and a carbon price that effectively puts a price on pollution and, and factors that decision into every economic investment decision. And I think in both cases, the company is really well placed being a company that is looking at public sector mechanisms, whether that's regulation or carbon pricing to invest in infrastructure. Um, and there is undoubtedly a significant investment requirement associated with this transition that, um, that we are well placed to benefit from. I think probably my final comment on this is, whilst where we sit today, this is largely a vision um, and we've seen some very positive directions of travel in terms of the evolution of policy. But my comment would be we're not there yet in terms of having enough clarity over what that policy is. Um, and and in my view, it's a couple of years at the very least before those policies are incentivizing or, or promoting real investment opportunities that the company will be able to benefit from. I've listed in the bottom right of that slide some of the, the various consultations or plans or strategy documents that the government has committed to publish this year, which we'll be looking at very closely as and when they come out. So hopefully that's a helpful context in terms of um, in terms of what the company does at a fundamental objective level, a very quick introduction to the UK infrastructure market as we see it. Um, I'll now go on to talk about the portfolio and where the company sits. And perhaps to start off, I wanted to, to describe the approach that we take to investing. So every infrastructure asset um, sits within its own special purpose vehicle, the investee company shown on this slide in the middle in green there. Um, so that company, and it's a UK limited company, is established with a specific purpose to build, own and operate a specific asset. So on day one, that company is just a company. It has no credit worthiness in its own right. And the way in which we structure or look to structure investments to create that credit worthiness and that investment story that ultimately we're investing into is by wrapping that company with con contracts um, that give it the property rights, the 
the, the asset ownership itself, the construction of that asset, the operations of that asset, the supply of goods to that asset, the offtake of goods or services from that asset. And as part of that construct, contractual structure, there is an allocation of risk to third parties to manage the risks embedded in each of those activities. So taking an example, the risk, um, the risk of a construction cost overrun or the construction delay or the fact that something is built that doesn't quite do what you thought it would do tends to be passed to construction contractors under engineer procure contract contracts or construct contracts. Um, similarly, uh, if we're thinking about a wind farm and um, the risks of the availability of that wind farm, so how many hours a year it is available to generate at its full capacity would be typically passed to the operator, a party such as Vestas or Siemens. And to the extent those things don't occur, then there is compensation paid back to the company. So it really is the contractual set of contractual relationships that are going to develop and build and operate this asset that create the creditworthiness around the specific infrastructure asset that we're financing. And then within that, we're looking at financing the debt component of the capital structure. And um, in doing so, and I'll come on, there's a slide to describe this, but Given we invest across a number of asset classes, there are always two components of risk. There is, there is the risk of the asset. So um, what is an asset, a wind farm or a school or a social housing project? What is it exposed to? What are the risks to the cash flows that will be generated by that asset? On the other hand, there is how do we as an investor get access to those cash flows? And that comes to where are we investing in the capital structure? And at all times, we're looking to offset those two things against each other. So where there is more project risk, so perhaps more revenue variability, it's an earlier stage construction asset we may be investing in. Um, we're looking to invest higher in the capital structure. So there is more equity buffer, there's more third party risk that takes loss before we start being exposed. And I'll come on to describe that in a bit more detail. So every investment we make is based on these principles. It's, it's taken from the project finance basis of investing. It's a well-established way of delivering um, third-party finance like ours into large capital investment projects. In terms of the portfolio itself, um, perhaps moving on, um, if we may, in very rough terms, we've invested across three sectors. Renewables makes up around 60% of the portfolio. And within renewables, we have exposure to the full suite of different technologies, solar, both ground mounted and rooftop, anaerobic digestion, wind, both onshore and offshore wind, biomass um, supported living, which is a sub, sorry, biomass and hydro within renewables. And that makes up 60% or so. PFI makes up around 25% of the portfolio, and there's a focus within that on education, healthcare, and leisure projects. Um, and I should add, no, no, they tend to be smaller scale projects as there's no kind of headline um, projects, uh, large headline projects within that. And then finally, supported living, uh, which makes up around 15% of the portfolio. And this is a subset of social housing. It's effectively the provision of social housing to individuals that have uh, a care requirement as part of their housing needs, um, which is a, a you know, very, very well-defined subset of the wider social housing mix. Um, Within that, there are 50 loans. As you can see from the chart there, there is a significantly higher number of underlying assets um, across which the investments are diversified. The weighted average life of our investments is 15 years. Across the portfolio, which I think is, is valued at a total of around 1.1 billion, uh, it is generating an average return of 8%. Around 5% of the portfolio is in construction. That number has significantly fallen over the last number of years. And that's particularly as subsidy mechanisms in the renewable space, in particular, but also PFI, PF2, have closed, which means there's this less primary construction deal flow for us to fund. And then finally, um, just under 40% of the portfolio has some form of inflation linkage or exposure. Um, which means in a higher inflationary environment, we'd expect some upside on the coupon that's being earned by our debt. Um, the next slide goes to the risk point that I mentioned earlier. So 
one of the questions we're often asked by investors is, given you invest across such a wide range of sectors, how do you go about evaluating the risk? And I come back to those two themes. So there is the risk of an asset and how um, that asset is exposed. So fundamentally, what is the variability in the cash flows generated by the asset? And then there is how do you as an investor get access to returns? Where are you taking those cash flows and the seniority of the waterfall of those cash flows in terms of how it flows to different investors? And this slide is addressing the first of those. So across the sectors we invest in at the top there, we've tried to give an indicative rating and don't worry, I won't go through every one and apologies if anyone is, is colorblind looking at this, this graphic. Um, but we've tried to rate each one on the basis of a, a, an impact if a risk were to occur and the likelihood of a risk occurring. And we've done that in four buckets. So market risk, so the extent to which an asset is exposed to volatile prices such as inflation or wholesale electricity prices or fuel prices. Credit risk, so going back to the structure that I described the credit worthiness of, of the project in which we're investing is ultimately dependent on the ability of a number of contracting parties to deliver services to that asset. And the extent of, of the credit worthiness of those relationships is an important factor there. So I think as we saw with Carillion quite publicly, the a credit event in a key counterparty in these projects can have a significant impact. Operational risks, this really recognizes the assets um, across the portfolio have very different levels of operational complexity from a solar project that I would argue is a relatively simple operational asset to something like a waste to energy project that has a seven storey boiler, waste coming in every 10 minutes, superheated steam and a team of 12 people operating the project 24 seven. So there's a range of complexities across the portfolio that we need to understand. And I think that essentially goes to your ability to allocate those various complexities and risks embedded in them to third parties as part of the managing is probably less in a, a more complicated asset. And then finally, legal regulatory risk. So there's probably two components to this. There is the components around we're just a UK investor, therefore we're exposed to UK based legislation, whether that's changes to corporation tax is a very relevant current one. Um, changes to health and safety or environmental legislation could have a knock-on impact to, to effectively the cost of compliance with the projects. The second basket is, by definition, I guess, as a fund, we are investing in public sector-backed revenue streams, um, and therefore any change to those revenue streams, whether that's retrospectively or otherwise, um, could significantly impact upon our projects. And we've seen examples of this more so in, in France, recently in Solo and, and Spain and Italy, um, going back a bit further in history. I think the UK has had an excellent track record of preserving subsidies and grandfathering those where there's existing accreditations, but it is a risk nonetheless. And without going um, through each box, I think in very general terms, biomass, so this is, uh, and within our portfolio, it makes up around 10%, and this is effectively the combustion of waste wood on an industrial scale, so it's not virgin biomass or pellets, which have various um, well-publicized sustainability issues. Our portfolio is limited to effectively burning waste wood to raise steam to produce electricity. That is a more complicated process, I think, by virtue of its operational complexity, the supply chain for those sorts of projects is perhaps less well advanced than in wind or solar and comes with risk. And I think the same is true in anaerobic digestion. And for those of you who are not familiar, anaerobic digestion is a process by which you take an organic matter, whether that's food waste or a, a grass silage or, or a farm slurry, um, and you are decomposing that in the absence of oxygen to produce methane, and then you are either burning that methane to produce electricity um, or cleaning that methane up and injecting it into the gas grid, both of which are, are entitled for, to different subsidies. And again, the supply chain in the UK for those projects is less well advanced perhaps than, than comparators in the solar and wind sector. And um, we've seen a number of parties have financial difficulties and the assets are just more operationally complicated. Um, again, it takes, takes relatively active operational management to manage what is a, 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 an ongoing chemical biological process. Um, hopefully this is a helpful picture in, in kind of presenting the, the type of risks that we're exposed to in, in the portfolio and, and how we see those risks. Here there's a lot of, of analysis that goes into to producing this. And I think in general terms, what we've tried to do 
in those sectors that have more asset-based risk, so ADM biomass as an example in this slide, we've sought more capital structure protection through investing more senior uh, to more senior level in the capital structure in those asset classes. And by no means is this picture a static, it, it, it absolutely changes in time. I mean, the example I always give is when we first invested in solar, the sorts of questions we were asked were, what do you mean there's sun in the UK? Um, who's going to build this? Who's going to operate it? It's a new asset class. How does the feed-in tariff work? What happens if you don't accredit in time? Um, how do we connect to the distribution grid rather than the transmission network? And largely over time, those risks have gone away by virtue of the fact that assets have been deployed and, and those risks have become understood. Um, and therefore the required return in those sectors has, has fallen as a result. So this picture shifts over time and I guess we're always looking to reevaluate that and also evaluate it in the context of any new sectors we might go into. Um, just moving forward, I'm very conscious of time and I've probably got a couple more slides I'd like to talk to um, before, before I give everyone the opportunity for some questions. Um, we're very conscious that uh, over the last 12 months or so, the NAV has uh, reduced and that has principally been driven by reductions to long-term electricity price forecasts and reductions to long-term or, or rather long reductions to short-term inflation assumptions um, through the OBR forecasts. I guess the first point to address perhaps is how in a debt fund are we exposed to these things and I think there's there's two answers to that. The first of which is there are certain cases where for very good reason, in my view, we have explicitly targeted an exposure through a debt instrument that has underlying equity characteristics. So exposure to electricity prices as an example. And in the sectors we've done that in, an offshore wind is a good example, um, that's very much been driven by, rather than have a highly subordinated debt investment that effectively has an equity type risk, with none of the associated upside, we've chosen to invest incrementally a small amount and gain the potential benefit of that upside. And offshore wind is an example where um, we were looking at it and the discussion absolutely started as a, a subordinated debt investment, but we were looking at a 30 year asset life in the context of a 50 year Crown Estate lease. And it was very hard for us to see how there wouldn't be a value there and, and in a debt instrument that that wouldn't we wouldn't have had access to that so have explicitly designed a mechanism whereby uh, there is an adjustment to the coupon based on both certain upsides and downsides so we have some exposure we've targeted and then we have other exposure that um, is the result of typically loans that were made historically. So back in 2013, 14, 15, there's been some fairly material reductions to long-term electricity price forecasts um, since that time. And as a result, a number of the loans are held at impaired values because of those long-term forecasts. So essentially we, we currently forecast that the full value of that loan will not be paid over the, the life of an asset. Um, and therefore its valuation is a function of the project cash flows, effectively assuming that that the debt sweeps the cash flows. There are bull and bear cases um, to electricity prices as there are for inflation. I put corporation tax on there because I'm very conscious of the announcement made as part of the budget. Um, there was a, around a four and a half million NAV impact when the previous corporation tax changed, the move from 17 to 19% occurred and would expect a similar quantum uh, or similar sensitivity to be reflected in respect of, of any new change. Um, but perhaps to focus for a moment on, on electricity prices, given that's that's the highest sensitivity that we've shown here. Um, I think, I guess the two key arguments in my mind for what's a long-term direction of travel here is on one hand, significant growth in renewables is cannibalizing to price. So we'll have a downward impact on price. On the other hand, um, what happens to demand in the transition to net zero and how will that demand be serviced through generation mix is probably the more bull factor um, in that demand's going to increase and we're not building sufficient generation to continue to deliver that at a low price. Um, I think in terms of direction of travel, and this is my personal view, I think I struggle to see how the level of renewables is built um, given the current policy environment and subsidy mechanisms. And we're seeing lots of unsubsidized renewables being developed, but I would have a significant question mark over who is gonna fund that given the risk profile of effectively taking a wholesale power price risk over 30 or 40 years without any fixed income component. 
Um, and then on the other hand, it's absolutely true that new generation is not being built to service demand um, where we currently sit today, let alone for any growth in demand. So my personal view is over time, um, there is a more of a bull case and a bear case for electricity prices, but that is my view. And, um, and we'll continue to publish the sensitivity of the fund as it evolves. I think perhaps the final point I'd like to make before I pause for, for questions, um, I guess is on a related theme on the next slide. Um, and, and I think what this is trying to show, and this is particularly relevant to renewables assets, is there is a, a significant difference in our view between the way in which different parties value renewable assets. And, and I should say up front, this isn't me saying that we're right and other people are wrong, but I think it is important when looking at a trust like GCP and, and understanding what does exposure to a wind farm or a solar project or a biomass project mean through shares in GCP, how that compares with exposure to those assets through any of our peer group. And what I've tried to do on this slide is summarize on the left there some of the key different or key assumptions that we see as being very different. An electricity price forecast, I guess, is, is the easiest one to describe. Um, we use a long-term price provider called AFWI. There tend to be three providers that people use um, and people tend to use a combination and, or average curves. AFWI is quite significantly the most conservative of those where we sit today. If we were to use the most aggressive in Aurora, we'd be adding about six pence to our NAV um, simply by just using a different basis of assumptions. I think in other areas, asset life, um, we, I guess, this, coming from a debt position, we've always looked at what is the contracted life of an asset based on the lesser of its technical capacity to operate, its planning rights, its property rights. And we've said we need to achieve an interest income and return a principal um, over that life. I think that's a very different starting point to if you're an aggressive equity bidder and looking to win a process and, um, and I guess assuming, for example, that the planning would be solved with by a material amendment and actually your asset will be there for 40 or 50 years. I think, you know, I guess my position is I, I absolutely see that there is potentially value for life extensions in these assets. It's very hard to see how we achieve net zero by switching everything we've built off and then building it again. But it's very hard to value that where we sit today. So we don't, um, and we're at the more conservative end on that. Then perhaps a final one, just indexation. We use OBR forecast in the short term, 3% uh, sorry, 2.5% RPI, 2% CPI in the long term. Others use uh, different assumptions, sometimes in excess of 3%, and the effect of compounding that over 20 or 30 years is, is, is quite significant. So the headline difference here is, which is summarized around a 30% potential difference in valuation from one side of this diagram to the other. And we are absolutely at the conservative end of that. And, and our approach to valuation is rooted in, in our debt background and, and the fact we've approached everything from a lending perspective. Um, I'll pause there for, for questions, perhaps I'm conscious I've probably gone over my half an hour time allocation, um, but I think that's probably a natural point to, to just take a moment for, for any questions and, uh, and as I say, the rest of this, the slides which, which I understand you have access to really go through the financial results, which I don't propose to go through in detail. Thanks very much for that uh, very interesting presentation, Phil. Uh, we have a small number of questions at present. Uh, I'll add a few of my own in if there's time. Uh, if anyone uh, would like to ask a question that hasn't yet, uh, just click the Q&A button towards the bottom of the screen and type in your question. Um, first two questions are from Tarek. Uh, first one being, how much of the recent derating do you believe is a function of higher interest rates? Yeah, thank you um, for the question. I, I actually don't think very much of it is a function of higher interest rates. I guess how this would be through to us is to the extent there are higher interest rates, um, there, is, there is a rebasing of the discount rates that are used to value our investments. And we, we Gravis, as the manager of the fund, do not set the discount rates. That's done by an independent valuer, Mazars. Um, and I think the thing that we have, if we look at the 10 years since IPO of this fund, 10 years ago, uh, over that 10 years, if we take a, a risk-free proxy in the 15-year guilt, the, the yield on that has decreased by over 
I think my observation would be we haven't seen a corresponding linear reduction in the discount rate that's equivalent to that. And I think the reason for that is there is, I guess, always a level of conservatism when a third party is applying discount rates to an investment. Um, the, these are illiquid assets. So the extent of kind of when you're comparing a yield on a very liquid investment a guilt and how that may change versus an illiquid investment and looking for effectively a trend over time in transactions that have happened there's definitely a lag between a change to to a headline risk-free rate and that feeding through to the market um so so i think practically whilst there should be a linkage there i think the reality of it is that that linkage is very lagged in time and it's certainly not a direct one for one linkage. So um, I'd say relatively limited amount has been a result of higher interest rates flowing through to higher discount rates. It's principally been driven by reductions of long term electricity price forecasts, the change to corporation tax from 17 to 19%, um, and a number of other um, asset revaluations that have happened in the last 12 months. I hope that's a helpful, uh, helpful answer to that question. Yes, I think, I think it is, Phil. Uh, next question is, uh, why was the dividend reduced to 7p? Yeah, good, good question. And so I did say I'd deal with that in the slides and, and didn't. Um, the, so, so the 10-year point, I think, was a good point of reflection. And having paid 7.6 pence, I think, at the time for seven years, what we had observed is that that reduction in the risk-free rate by in excess of 75%. So the, the risk-free basis at which we were investing had, had come down significantly. In addition to that, the, the risk premium over that rate was had also come under pressure and I think had come under pressure from assets maturing and risk falling away. My example of solar earlier, so the required return from investors was lower, but also infrastructure as an asset class has significantly evolved and become attractive. So there is just more capital chasing what is an increasingly limited pool of assets. So I guess all of those things in their own right wouldn't be an issue. The fund, however, it does receive capital back by way of repayment of loans. Um, so there's scheduled amortization. There's also the unscheduled receipt of principal where loans are prepaid early. And we we have to reinvest that. So over time, there'll be a natural reset of the achievable returns um, to, to the headline rates uh, or the market, prevailing market at that point in time. So I think really the, the 7p dividend adjustment was based on an assessment as to whether the 7.6 pence was sustainable given the current market for reinvestment and therefore sustaining the historic rate. And I think R in the board's assessment was that it wasn't, and therefore we needed to make a change. I guess in anticipation of reinvestment being at lower rates and over time there being a reset in the, the level of return being generated by the fund. I think my comment would be that it wasn't in response to anything changing overnight or a particular issue that had um, transpired. And therefore, you know, that natural reset will take time. So we would expect there to be coverage at a 7p um, and maybe that coverage would erode over time. It was very much set with the expectation of keeping the dividends stable over the medium term. So I think we recognize stability of the dividend is important to, to shareholders and therefore we don't wanna be coming out each year setting a new target. Um, so there was a, a detailed assessment done of a reasonable set of scenarios um, to ensure that that seven pence is, is sustainable over time. Um, so it, to summarize, it was very much a response to long-term macro trends that have impacted this company over 10 years, that primary obligation or, or need to reinvest capital that comes back and the resulting reset that would happen in the overall level of return being generated by the company. Thanks, Phil. Um, next question is from Paul. If I recall, you said about 30% of your income has some inflation protection. Is the non-inflation protected income concentrated in any class of assets? Um, it is. So uh, our PFI portfolio doesn't really have any inflation linkage. Um, the inflation linkage tends to be 
concentrated in the social housing portfolio where the interest rate is effectively um, uh, a fixed rate linked to CPI. And then there is an element of the renewables portfolio that also has inflation linkage and probably about 50% of the renewables portfolio has some form of inflation protection linkage. So it's weighted towards social housing and renewables. Um, Kate asks, what are the key drivers of asset valuation? So this probably goes back to my final slide. So there's, there's, I think the challenge in valuing an asset, which is set, essentially is a, a quite ultimately a question of what discount rate are you applying to a set of cash flows? So all of our assets are valued on a discounted cash flow basis. So it's a long term, um, a long term cash flow that we're looking to try and get to a present value of. So the key questions are what is a cash flow and what is a discount rate and those two things are inextricably linked because i think as my previous slide showed there is a potentially significant difference in the aggressiveness of assumptions driving a cash flow and um, whether that's what inflation you're assuming over the long term or what power price you're assuming or what asset life extension you're assuming um and in, a, in an ideal world in a true market the discount rate should compensate for any change in the aggressive nature of those cash flows i guess i guess where you sit in the capital structure goes to how confident are you of those cash flows so um so not only the project assumptions but what seniority of payment do you have over those and i think my observation would be in reality the discount rate doesn't compensate for those things and i think there is a risk that someone thinks they can invest in a wind farm through gcp and a wind farm through another fund and it is the same investment because the discount rates are largely the same and therefore the embedded assumptions must be the same. And my observation would be that it's absolutely not the case in the market as it has played out. And that's why I think from my perspective in, I guess, communicating relative risk to shareholders, it's so important to, to try and make people aware of, of that relative position. And again, this isn't me saying I'm right, they're wrong. It's just understanding relative risk. So, so I think what Mazars is job as our independent valuer is in a nutshell, it's to try and understand to the greatest extent possible how aggressive we are being about the cash flows generated by a project, what that means in terms of debt serviceability and the coverage ratio that exists between those cash flows and our debt service. And then what's the appropriate discount rate in light of all of that. And, um, uh, and that I think is, is effectively the components of our valuation. I hope that helps answer the question. If not, please do shout or, uh, or uh, ask a further question. Thank you. Um, next question from Charles. How concerned are you with the difficulties some investors have experienced with lending to anaerobic digestion plants? Uh, what measures have you taken to limit the downside? Certainly, so we are very aware of issues elsewhere in the anaerobic digestion market. Um, I guess the thing I would say up front is anaerobic digestion as an asset can work really well and coming back to I think an earlier comment in my view absolutely has a role in our energy mix it's renewable it's base load um, it has a role in both electricity generation heat and potentially hydrogen production um, so and it can work really well and we have had in our portfolio some good some very good and some bad experience of anaerobic digestion um, and we've been investing in anaerobic digestion since 2013. And that's put us in, I think, a relatively unique position in the market to understand that asset class. Um, it's certainly, we certainly have a lot more history in that asset class than, than a number of, of peers who have come into it more latterly. Um, so I think our summary of what makes a good anaerobic digestion project really ultimately comes down to the operator and and the operator understanding a chemical biological process and understanding how to adapt that process to changes in feedstock changes in external temperature um, changes in the biology or chemistry of a tank ultimately and um, therefore working with good operators is absolutely fundamental in that market and um, so so what, what have we done to, I guess, try and mitigate that risk? I think, I think the first thing I'd say is, is learning lessons from history. So we have, 
we have suffered from investing in anaerobic digestion. We've also seen where it can be done really well. So learning from that, I think, is, is the key thing that we can do in terms of moving forward. And, and we still do have a number of anaerobic digestion investments in our pipeline. And I think, um, I think the market has shifted from being construction stage opportunities to more operational um, opportunities. And I think in that there is a decrease in risk because it, actual operations are much more transparent. Um, but, um, but nonetheless, it's a sector we approach with caution. And um, and I think in any potential new investment, we would be looking at particularly the operator, but also the other lessons that we've learned elsewhere to, um, to make sure we're the right side of the good and bad AD. And I'd emphasize there are both and, and it can be an asset class that works really well. And it certainly doesn't suffer um, yet, albeit there's some signs it's going this way. It doesn't suffer from the same dynamic in solar and wind that there's a weight of capital chasing those specific assets and therefore uh, there is there is pressure to be aggressive on assumptions or required return in order to to participate in that asset class. Thank you, Phil. Uh, there are four more questions currently. I think we should have time to, to deal with those. Uh, the next one is from Tom. Um, at launch, the distinctive feature of the fund versus other PFI stroke PPP infrastructure funds was that this fund provided a bespoke debt instrument structure for each investment. Is that still the case? It is absolutely still the case. Um, I guess what's changed is that it's not just PFI and PPP. I think we are still always looking to design a bespoke debt product for a specific asset. Um, that come into my the risk analysis chart I showed earlier that that is baked in a full understanding of the risks of an asset class and seeks to manage those in the most appropriate way. And that goes to what debt covenants do we have? What's the term of that debt? What's the appropriate interest rate? How is that debt structured from a repayment profile? What's the associated security on that, that debt? What's the relationship with other lenders or creditors in the structure? So absolutely, it's a bespoke product in each case. And, and the key job for me, as I see it in terms of any new transaction is on one hand, fully understanding the risk of a project and then making sure that there is an appropriate financing instrument that gives us an attractive risk adjusted return in, in accessing that asset. So you, if I understand correctly, you're the originator of the, of the debt instruments. Correct, exactly. Yeah, it's, we, we have never participated in a syndicated debt purchase or bought an off the shelf debt instrument. So we are always designing a bespoke product that suits a specific financing need in the context of an asset. Very good. Um, next from Sarah, uh, why the decrease in net assets between uh, 2019 and 2020 from 980 to 915 million pounds? Yes, yeah, so this was principally driven by revised long-term electricity prices. I think 54 million pounds of that adjustment um, was attributable to revised long-term electricity price forecasts. Um, I think four and a half million of it was due to the corporation tax change. And then there were various other re asset revaluations that, um, that featured in that. But the principal contribution was revised long-term electricity price forecasts, which I think came down approximately 16% year on year between 30th of September um, 19 and 30th of September 2020. Um, on that, that topic, uh, Tarek again asks, how much of the electricity production is sold for with locking in prices? Um, so this is variable at any point in time that we have assets that typically the assets have long term power purchase agreements that are, are typically structured in a way where there is a pass through of a market price, whether that's the season ahead or day ahead market price, a number of which do have price lock-in mechanisms within them. So at the start of a new season, so in um, at the start of October or the start of March, the price is fixed for the next six months automatically based on, on whatever the reference price is at that time. Um, so, I mean, I'm conscious I'm probably not going to give you the answer you want in terms of a percentage, but, um, but it does move around over time. And I guess the other protection we have is a number of the PPAs have floor prices. So, um, so there's effectively a floor on how low the market price can go before it effectively becomes a fixed price. Um, I, I'm happy to go away and kind of try and work out that percentage in more detail. Um, but I think my comment would be 
the market horizon of the electricity market is typically two to three years. So any ability to lock in prices is largely limited to the forward two or three years. And typically we wouldn't go beyond a year um, at the very, I think the, the longest we've ever done is two years um, just because of market liquidity and, and ability to access prices in the market. So, um, so in the context of a 15, 20 year residual life on an asset, actually the portion of, of locked income, locked in income versus variable income is, is relatively low by virtue of just the market horizon of, of electricity markets. Uh, okay. Uh, now the next question, uh, new one's just come up from Alan. Um, do you now invest in new build solar and wind assets or just purchase established units? Um, so I, I don't think we will be doing much, if anything, in new build solar and wind. I think um, that market is hugely competitive. I think I would observe you have to be, going back to my assumption diagram, you have to be towards the relative extreme right side of that diagram, given how competitive those markets are to be successful in processes would be my observation. And I just don't think that's, again, coming from a conservative lending position, um, I just don't think that's a space in which we feel comfortable participating. Um, in, in, so I think, there is, I think there is a market in purchasing operating assets, but it, I would probably equally apply my it's very competitive comment to that as well. Um, I think the other comment I would make in terms of new build is unlikely to be subsidized given the current subs or policy environment. There is some potential that the next contract for difference round in the UK at the end of this year promotes some solar and wind under a subsidized model, but I think all that will do is make it even more competitive. Um, and I think unsubsidized solar and wind wouldn't fall within the investment remit to this fund because there is no public sector backed income stream against which we would be lending. So um, I think in aggregate, I don't expect to be doing much more solar and wind just because whether it's new build um, or not, it's either very competitive or not supported by a subsidy. Thanks, Phil. Uh, I'll just slip in a, a couple of questions of my own at that point, if I may. A um, couple of possible uh, future op infrastructure opportunities, which I wonder whether they, they are opportunities that could be applicable to, to GCP's model or not. First of all, one thing we're going to need is, is a substantial build out of the EV charging network. Yeah. Uh, are there possible opportunities there? And the other area that the government is, is keen on is um, the, the digital uh, network broadband uh, facilities. Again, are, are there opportunities uh, in that sector? There certainly are, and we've certainly seen a number. Um, I guess the extent to which those opportunities fit within what is the relatively narrow parameters of this fund. So there is a public sector back support mechanism. I think in both of the examples you give, so both in EV charging and digital infrastructure, the government government support to date has been much more seeding funds through to, to, to effectively invest in the capital investment of those projects rather than perhaps provide revenue support mechanisms, um, which would be more akin to the the thing, the, the sort of investment we've made before. Um, I think. I think there are some challenges in the EV charging um, space around picking winners. And um, ultimately, it's a very, at the moment, potentially a very disaggregated market. And um, in a way, it's a bit of a land grab. And, and ultimately, there is an uncertain question over how demand will evolve. And, and I think that those factors, given the returns that seem to be available, have made it difficult for us to, to be competitive. I think in the digital infrastructure space, we've seen a number of, of um, kind of rural broadband type opportunities. Um, and I think my observation there is, is the market seems to have jumped to a very competitive cost of capital. Uh, again, embedded within that is the assumption of the growth in demand or ability to attract customers. Um, and I think in funding that network, there is also the risk that technology quite quickly supersedes the need for a physical network and um, and wireless networks 5g 6g if that ever happens is 
potentially mitigates or, or, or renders a, a, a highly capital intensive physical infrastructure as, as worth less. And so without the government backing and, and you're effectively taking demand risk and there's element, element of picking technology winners, I think it, it has been hard for us to get our heads around. That's not to say there, there won't be investment opportunities in the future. And I think there's a lot of ancillary infrastructure that's going to be needed to support the rollout of EV charging, so distribution transmission networks. Interestingly, the government um, announced that they intend to um, introduce the, the offshore transmission scheme. Octos have been very successful where effectively private investors can access um, access specific offshore transmission developments associated with offshore wind projects. That's been very successful at, at efficiently building new transmission offshore. I think the government expressed their intent to look at that onshore and it could be interesting to develop that in the con or investing that in the context of demand growth for um, EV charging and where does how does our transmission system need to evolve to support motorway service stations having lots of people charging or industrial um, industrial sites out of town where everyone's, everyone drives to suddenly have a big electricity demand because everyone's going to be charging their cars uh, during the day when they're at work so um, so I think there's some, you know, we've seen an example with Jaguar Land Rover where they've recently supported an offtake agreement with a, a, a waste biomass project on the basis of, of the demand from their workforce. Um, everyone's going to be parking their cars indeed. I think they're giving them electric cars, and um, which has a demand. So, so I think there are some really interesting infrastructure investment opportunities that will come out of this. I'm not convinced today it's funding the physical charging network or the physical broadband infrastructure um but absolutely they're sectors where we're, we're we try and stay close to and we're very aware of and we we do see investment opportunities in that we continue to assess thanks very much for that philip that was very much appreciated uh, uh, th thanks for giving up your time for to share soccer i'm sure our members found uh, the presentation and your answers most valuable thank you it's been a pleasure and if there's any follow-up questions please do please do let me know We'll send them through.